I am unashamed. What about you? All right, so welcome back to Unashamed. We, in our last overtime, which, you know, it's, we say this all the time just to remind it to our audience because for you guys it's a couple of days, but for us we just did it. So we just finished our last overtime because we record a couple when we record. And we had a... <laughs> Had quite the breakdown in our overtime because Zach dropped one of his. Well, that's flat- a new word. He's been practicing it. I would say probably <laughs> three or four months because he kind of owned the pronunciation of it. But he did it really uh, quickly. It was about a four or five syllable word. That's he- what. That's what got me about the fourth one. I, I was like. <laughs> It After was, the fourth syllable? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. He dropped one of his classic big words. And so it turned I think it was, into... I think it's actually six syllables. Ooh, six syllables. It turned into a reenactment yeah. of Gomer and Goober. <laughs> I think I was Andy Gomer. <laughs> no, I was Goober. He was Gomer. And he was going, Judy, Judy, Judy. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> Do it again. So, uh, Zach, yeah, I was like, but I was, but I was passionately making a point that, I mean, <laughs> as soon as I said the word and it was just like, I mean, it, it just went off the rails. Well, it did. I mean, it, all three of you guys. It <laughs> led I mean, to it, the, what I'm saying is that particular word is not in the Bible. <laughs> no. Do you want to say it again for those say who aren't listening? Say it again for overtime. Well, hold on, hold on. Do it again. Dude, I, I feel like, I feel like, I'm, I feel like you, I'm, it's like, what, like, I, I, yeah, like, it's, I'm going to say it, and then you guys are going to, again, you're going to, yeah. No, go ahead and I'm say it. Go ahead and say it. You here. brought it up. You no, it up. you set yourself sort of up. Well, I'm, I, okay, the word, the word I used was epistemology. Epistemology. Which I thought I'd used before, but no. epistemology. Which is what? And you, yeah. Which, which now the, look, now the, the last time of, I asked it, you for a definition, it was a seven-minute meandering of fragments and prepositional phrases that had no meaning. So it what is it in a what is the point of the word in a bumper sticker? I feel like I'm doing a yes or no it's, question. It's it's how do how do we know what we know? How do we know what how do we know what we know? There was a guy who was famous for that. I think his he was the Secretary of Defense for years. One Donald Rumsfeld, oh, Rumsfeld. who said, I'm not sure what we know is knowable if we could know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anything. Yeah, that would. That's what knowledge. I would call. That's that's called an. Yeah, that's a that's a that's an epistemological crisis that he's in. Hmm. Well, so I you want, think about. So our he culture. actually used it in a sentence. Good work, Zach. Now, now you're teaching us. Now you're teaching. Yeah, us. yeah it's a, yeah, but well, but when, it's relevant because here's why because we live in a culture that says there is no truth. Yep. You can't really know anything other than what your own experience is. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it, I mean, it is kind of the center of what I think is kind of our cultural moment is this idea of how do we know what truth is? How do we know? How do we know what we know? Well, let me uh, ask you, you know this. Because it's revealed. Let me, yeah. let me use this as an illustration. So Jesus came upon some, he was preaching in a city uh, in Matthew 11. This is a verse like 20. And I realize I'm taking this a little bit out of context, <laughs> which would be poor yeah. hermeneutic, which is how we study the Bible. Yeah. But just for another word. illustrative purposes, I will do this. Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. And so he said, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So I make this statement based on that verse. It seems to imply that Jesus knew what would have happened if something that didn't happen would have happened. Yeah. Do you know what that's called? What Zach, Zach no, is- it, it's called that there's a level that God knows what's going to happen. He knows what has happened. And he knows what would happen if something that didn't happen would happen, which is it's called, yeah, it's God's middle. It's called God's middle knowledge. When you when you when you marry ology with ism, you marry those two, and you have the heart of false teaching that false prophets bring forth. 
Mary, ology to ism, and then you've got it. Ology to ism. That's what he said when he ology said ism? that. Ology-ism? Yeah. You, you marry those two together, ology and ism, and that's what you get. Mm. Okay. Which is nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> that's why in epistemology where, where is it in the Bible what verse was that that's in Romans no no it ain't in the Bible but I'm just saying that's what it, I'm like it, uh, it's not in the Bible well I don't believe I just refrain from using I that I feel like oh. but, we, but, we, but we have words we have yeah. words that we what we use that aren't in the Bible well, Jesus we is the, the word Trinity. it's not in the Bible that's true ultimately uh, ultimately, Jesus is the Word of God. He's the communication of God, and the Word became flesh. But I, I will remind you, as I have many times, my loving cousin, <laughs> that when Paul said Christ didn't send me to baptize, 1 Corinthians one seventeen, he sent me to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Boy, that was a drop. That was a mic drop moment. <laughs> well, that's because I was trying to pull up the scripture. I wanted to read the rest of it because because we did because there is another part to that that it, it's, he's not negating wisdom. Right. He's negating human wisdom. Mm -hmm. He says, "But we do preach a wisdom." I'm trying to pull it up here from God. We do preach a wisdom from God. So mm -hmm. there, it's not that we don't preach wisdom uh, or that he didn't preach wisdom. It's just what kind of wisdom uh, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. So I think when you, some of the words that, that are terms that are, have been used in, in certain circles are, it's just a way of condensing a more, uh, a bigger conversation into one word. So it, it, it just, it, I think it's more the reason why these terminologies come up is just for the sake of expediency, like a the term theology, Mm -hmm. I mean, the study of God. I mean, we're, we're obviously not against theology. We're not against the study of God. Yeah. You know, but but you would just condense that into one word and then use it because I think that um, it, I think it's just it's it's just a linguistic uh, linguistical tool to communicate. But um, but I do think that our culture does have an issue with how we arrive at knowledge because what we've been taught is that the re the way you can know something to be true is if it benefits you. Or if it validates your own experience, then it must be true, and that's a horrible that's a horrible way to address uh, knowledge. That's a, that's a horrible part of the term again. Epistemology. The reason why we know something's true is because God reveals it to us, and so that was the the point I think we were talking about in Scripture when we start with that the Scripture is the inspired Word of God, and that it's the ultimate and final authority. What we're what we're essentially establishing there is a framework for how we can arrive at, at truth. We would back everything up through what the scripture says, you know. And if it if it if it's not if we can't get there through the Bible, then we just don't go there. Now there may be differences of opinion on how we get there, and that's kind of where I, I think we should have some grace and leniency and humility. Yeah, I always lean towards Zach. Those. I would say to to turn a phrase in our current culture. Most people would say all prophecy has its origin in the will of man. And you couldn't even say in the will of man. You would say all prophecy has its will in the origin of he, she, they, whatever. Because it's all about your yeah. experience. So, and, and you wouldn't even believe in prophecy. So you'd have to even go back further than that. So in other words, it's always about the experience. It's never about any sort of absolutism. Wouldn't you say that's a fair statement? I mean, it's, it's never about any, any kind of absolute truth or anything. Yeah. Well, it, it, the only thing that's absolute, which is kind of the, that's the interesting thing about it. Yeah. There is an absolute truth, which is to them, which is that there are no absolutes, you know, which is an absolute, which is, that's the whole thing that you, you saw off the branch you sit on. But yeah, it's it's your experience, your lived experience, your perceived experience, and in our culture, it's primarily based on what is your status as um, as someone who's disenfranchised or, or your your minority status. So if you have di different intersections of of um, disenfranchisement, then you can essentially gain more uh, power in determining what's true, what's not true, and and it's just not. You, you start to look at that, and you and you and we're scratching our heads, and we're wondering, wait, how do we get to a point? where we're questioning things that are obvious realities. Like, like we can't even know 
things anymore, like gender and and uh, you know all these things that we're like, how do how do we get there? And the and the way we got there is we just removed the standard. We said there is no standard other than yep. our own selves and our own yep. perceptions and our own preferences. Um, so to me, it's it's a humility again of God, of of people. Ha- you have to fall in your fo- face before the living God and say, you gotta say that you have to say this. I am a creature, and I'm not the creator. Like you got to begin there. I mean, if you, I mean, and it's obvious if you really think about it that you're not the creator because you can't determine your own reality. You can't determine your own gender. At the end of the day, we can play around like you can, but you really can't. I mean, your DNA, you can't change these things because you're not creator. And I think that the, that, that hostility that we all kind of feel is this, it's this pull to where, man, I don't like being in the position that I'm in, but I keep thinking about that quote from St. Augustine that said, uh, what did he say? Uh, we were made for you and you alone speaking to God and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And it's not until you rest in the, in the, in your position as a creature that you're ever going to be able to rest. If you're trying to be the creator, then you're basically banging your head up against the wall of your existence, the boundary of your existence. You're not getting out of it. Like we are creatures. And if we're creatures, then the way we can know things is, is when the creator reveals to us, the creature, what he wants us to know. Well, and that takes a humility. No, on one our way part of looking at it, it's, it's, you know, which is a pretty, uh, Fascinating. They claim there's been 118 billion people on the earth since it was created, since it got here. Now, they had to say since the explosion. And, but for 40 people, right, right at 40, maybe one or two, either way, the information that they put forth in book form that's now available to anyone on planet Earth, the 7.2 billion. Out of the 118 billion, 40 people put in book form the wildest story I've ever read. My that, question is... That is cohesive. Is that I, actually... I, I mean, uh, yeah. and it follows a pattern from the, from the time it was made, is what this says. God made the cosmos... And then God made us. Well, you start looking at that. You say, how in the world could this kind of information covering all of good, bad, right, wrong, evil, lying, stealing, murder, rape, uh, salvation, I mean, spirits of God, angelic beings, 40 people sat down over this period of time and, and their error would stop and 400 years would go by and from Malachi to Matthew and God didn't say a word, but the information that came out of 40 individuals, it, it's amazing. And you know what the, re, you know what the rebuttal to that would be, Phil? The rebuttal. I, I, would I don't be, know. That's it, it. It would be, that's impossible. And then, and then our rebuttal would be, we agree. That's why Peter says that no prophecy of scripture it's a matter of one's own interpretation. That is my no point. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. You would say, yeah, it's impossible. That did not come from a group of men. That's that my point. That had to have been orchestrated. Yeah, and you start looking at, like, and this is another thing, too. Like we come into discussion as twenty uh, as uh, uh, 2023 you know, uh, Christians. We don't understand a lot of these prophecies in the Old Testament because we're, we didn't really, we didn't grow up memorizing the Torah. That's right. Like you would have if you were, you would have been Jewish. Um, we didn't, we didn't memorize the Torah. Uh, hey, a lot of Christians have never even read the Old Testament. But, w- but if you start to consider how many Old Testament prophecies have been fulfilled in Christ, Whew. and you start to calculate the odds against that, I mean, it is a pretty profound apologetic or you know defense of of the scriptures to know that the 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 dead sea scrolls and the and just the the 25,000 copies of the new testament that have been preserved and you start thinking about this book of antiquity that is unparalleled by any other book in terms of its preservation that is my I mean point. it really is mind blowing it is but, uh, what the what the guys the what what our friends the greens are doing at, at uh, the bible uh, museum in, in DC and I mean, you start, you, I mean, you, you guys have been up there. I mean, you start, once you start to kind of scratch the surface of that, it, I mean, it's a little bit overwhelming to think, whoa, I mean, there is power 
not just in the word of God as the inspired scripture. There's a there's power in the history of it, in the preservation of it, and all that surrounds it. I mean, the, I mean, I I think the church needs to elevate the word of God again. Uh, David Platt at Passion this year, uh, Sadie told me that um, he got up there, and you know what his sermon was? Uh, this blows me away. He he read something out of the Old Testament how they used to worship at the reading of the word of God, and David Platt. His sermon was he quoted Romans chapter one through Romans chapter eight, just quoted the whole thing. He'd memorized it hmm. in front of however many thousand college students, and they just cheered at the reading of the word of God. They worshiped at the reading of the word of God. And one of the things that I see in in, in the Christian church where you see uh, life begin to evaporate out of a church is when you leave your love and your allegiance to the word of God. I can promise you, you're gonna you're gonna see the life being sucked out of your church. If you want to you want to see a church that's full of life, I'm telling you, is it'll be a church that 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 believes in the scriptures, that that worships the God of the scriptures, and that holds the scriptures in the very in a very very high high view. You do all these underwear commercials, you know, and you're trying to come up with new material and new ideas, but. Uh tell you this so today when i was on my way here i just drove right on by uh and so i know the the people that were already here were thinking i wonder where he's going but they got to realize that some some days when you have discomfort in the bowel region <laughs> you take it for the team and look you here's what i want to say about my pair of tommy johns <laughs> When you get in a bind and panic sets in, one of the good things <laughs> about having a good pair of underwear is they're easily removed. <laughs> what do you think about that? I man? acted that out this morning <laughs> on the riverbank. I, I don't. I don't hold conferences <laughs> dealing with underwear. Well, if you did, private or public, <laughs> if you did, you would talk about Tommy John's because they are the most comfortable underwear out there on the market. I've been a huge fan long before they sponsored our podcast. They, I guess, they are easy on yeah. and off. There's no doubt about Find it. Out a lot about yourself in an emergency. Yeah. What they say is they've been covering our butts for 15 years, and I like that. That's uh, they've sold over 20 million pairs. They have thousands and thousands of five-star reviews. They have fanatics, of which I am one. We are. Uh, we all wear them. They have the best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free guarantee. Uh, they have new spring designs, and I just got uh, s- uh, some new pairs, and they do have some interesting new designs uh, that you can check out. So we encourage you to shop uh, Tommy John for these new designs. Uh, go to TommyJohn.com slash Phil. You're going to get 20% off your first order. So that's 20% off right now at TommyJohn.com slash Phil. See their site for details. Well, if you're going to have my name on it, tell them to send me some. All right. Mm-hmm. We're going to get Phil some more Tommy Johns. Well, it was obviously Peter's point to, because he laid out without saying specifically how you view the Lord and how you view God affects how you live. And yeah. that, that, that's, the way, that's the way he started. I mean, he said your divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And so then he moves on to say that he had given us these precious promises in, in four. Well, how do we know about the promises? Well, they were written down. Yep. All these promises from Genesis 3 on, they were written down. Yep. Listen. We, we have listen, them. While you're there, and Jesus did many other things as well. At the end of John, the last thing John says, if every one of them, Zach, were written down, what Jesus did, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. I mean, what a yeah. what a statement. You said you just saw you saw a glimpse of it. You should you should hear the rest of it. You wouldn't believe 
how the whole Which world makes you wonder, well, why didn't they write them down? And yeah. I, I would, I would, I would propose that it's because he could have written more, but this was revealed to us so that we would have the image of the invisible God in Jesus. And this is enough. We got what you, we need. To. You got what you need. That's why when we get to chapter two, you know, the number one thing you got to watch out for, or really two things that we're going to see. Speaking of light, God has given us everything we need for life. When someone is trying to add something more than who Jesus is or what he says through prophecy or, you know, modern day prophecy, or they're giving you a prophecy, but meanwhile, their personal life is living in a sinful way contrary to obvious biblical truths, that there should be some red flags go up. If you're oh, bringing up something more than Jesus or, or something that Jesus didn't, didn't address, and meanwhile, your life is living in direct contrast to the obvious nature of God, let me just tell you, I'm not going to listen to anything you're saying. And and that that's where he's going with it. Oh, that. somebody 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 gave me a, a prophetic word um a few weeks ago out of a thing Jill and I spoke at and uh I, I debated on whether to share this. I I'm gonna share it because I think it's important. Uh, I was standing in the back of the room, you know, a couple hundred people, and you know, I I mean it was so they were like given, I guess, prophecies or whatever, and, and uh the guy goes, he gets up there. And he, he, he says, uh, uh, is there a David here? I'm thinking, what, I, I, what, what is going on? You know, is there a David? And of course, there's no David there. So then he, I, and I just met this guy like five minutes earlier. He said, well, I guess this is for Zach and Jill. And he said, <laughs> there is. <laughs> that's a, that's a, exa- well, you yeah, know, they thought exactly. about naming you, Dave. <laughs> And I'm like, he said, you have the, you have David's anointing was his prophecy, but I was facing, he said, you're facing a major trial in your marriage. I mean, he's in front of all these people and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> it's kind of ticked me off, you know? And I'm like, so he's telling he's like saying this in front of everybody. And, and I'm like, and he's like, but you're going to make it through it. And, you know, you're going to come out the other side of this and. And I, I was so mad because I'm like, like don't, like, don't speak that over my marriage, you know. But he came up to me afterwards. He's, hey, man, I just want to check in with you. How did you receive that that prophecy? And I was like, oh, yeah, that wasn't from God. <laughs> He's like, what? <laughs> I said, that was not from God. I don't know where that came from. Like, I mean, I said, I'm, I mean, I'm going to tell you, like, like, I don't know what you're talking about. But, but it was like he just conjured this up. And it, I think it is an issue in the church that we we say we get these words from God. And I'm like, like. Man, I'm gonna if I'm gonna say I got a word from God, I can tell you one thing: it's gonna be backed up by the Scripture. I'm a hundred every time. I'm not telling you I got a word from God, and because I carry no authority outside of what's in in this book that I hold right here, and you know, that's the authority, not me. I didn't get it. I didn't receive this this thing from God to give to you, other than what's been revealed in the Scriptures here. Now I do think the Holy Spirit speaks to me personally about my own sin. You know what I mean? Um, things I'm dealing with, but. But he didn't tell me, hey, Al, I think there's something going on over, you know, like I, I don't, I, I, I didn't know where that came from. And it kind of shocked me because I hadn't been in that kind of setting before. And, um, but it just made me think about like how often we claim to, to, that we get word from God. Well, people and, and have I'm asked like, me, I don't, people have asked me about it before, Zach. And I always say, look, when you're hearing voices, um, there are multiple options, you know, I mean, like it could, you know, you have your own voice in your head. You know, you, you speak, you know, you have your voice, like you're thinking in, to yourself and yourself answers. Yep. Um, you have Satan's voice or, or evil. That's a voice uh, that sometimes we see speaks uh, in Scripture. And and we have examples of that. Um, there is the Holy Spirit is nudging, as you mentioned, Zach, that, that will nudge us in directions. But I, I tend to agree with you. That tends to be towards our own conscience. Uh, and you know there are some examples where you know God has spoken to people in the Bible directly, but there's a lot of options on voices. So when someone tells me they know this, that, or the other, I say, well, you better weigh those options and make sure, because you you know I, I want to make sure and know before I, I'm definitive 
um, when I've given someone because you don't want to go in there like a yeah, yeah, like I like know like yeah the old uh, it, it just felt like the fortune teller thing you know what I mean like is there a Bill in the room um, yeah I got a I had a third cousin named Bill uh, this is, yeah um, this I'm, I'm I'm seeing pizza we had pizza together when we were kids and I, it, it kind of felt like that kind of deal and um, and I. I I don't want to say how God works and how God doesn't work. I mean, I, I'm not closed off to any of these things. But if you if you're going to give a prophecy, then I think you should be able to bear the responsibility of the rebuke that could come your way if the if the, if the prophecy does not happen or if it's not accurate. Then you need we need to say, hey, that was not from God. You know what I mean? We need to have that that thing. But 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 in in this Second Peter passage, I think it's interesting that he establishes the authority of the Word of God. At the end of chapter That's one, point. I mean, he goes in this whole thing about the authority of the word of God, and then he immediately goes to, but the word, but, and then false prophets also arose among the people. So it's almost like the authority of scripture is here. <laughs> and then, we, oh, and in addition, but on the other side, false teachers. So these two things can't go together. False prophets and the authority of scripture can, they, they don't, they don't work together. Because one holds the c- cancels the he other. He makes one out. a big point all through there, saying we did not follow cleverly invented stories. We have heard the voice. We have the word of the prophets. In other words, he made a clear distinction. Peter did that. There's a we and there's a them before he ever gets to the false right. prophet. So, but he also, you know, I started off saying, you know, he he's given us everything we need for life and godliness to his power, and then, but they're based on promises. The promises have obviously been written down, which he gets to, but then he gets into your life. And it that verse 8 is a key verse to Second Peter because he's he's trying to get them to be effective and productive for Jesus because we know him. He, the, this God of the universe is knowable through Jesus Christ. And so then he validates what he's into, one, by reminding them the brevity of life where all he, he was at his life's end. But we also have this, you know, our faith and trust and hope in an eternal God. And that's why we made the big deal about the, you know, the thought I had about, him viewing that departure as an exodus, which is a liberation from our bondage to decay, which the evil one, that voice inside of us, he uses that to control people by their fear of death. And that's just a reality. And so then he validates all that by saying, we didn't just come up with this. I was at the mountain. I saw the son of the living God Talking with dead people who had been what something they they were they were living again they had arrived. By the way, Zach, all prophecy, because Elijah was there on the mountain and Moses was there, all law and prophecy had been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. See what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, there's there's something to be said about that. That was why he used the Mount of Transfiguration to show that everything was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So it doesn't leave a lot of room for yeah, us it's, going it's, forward. It's, 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 yeah, he's, he's showing the supremacy and the centrality of Jesus, the sovereignty of God, you know. And so then when you move into this this verse, chapter 2, and he talks about the false prophets, he says the he, he gives the opposite of, of that approach. He says, but the false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce, which is always the nature, by the way, of this, right? It's a secret introduction, destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. So one of the one of the hallmarks of false teachers it's it's an ult, ultimately what it is. It's it is a denial of the master of the the denial of the lordship of Christ, a denial of his sovereignty. It could be a denial of a bodily resurrection, of a second coming, of a virgin birth, or whatever. I mean, there's all kind of ways that you can deny the kingship of Jesus. I heard uh, one scholar uh, said, or one a Bible teacher said recently, he said, "No, nobody has a problem with Jesus. Everybody loves Jesus." Everybody loves Jesus until you tell them who he really is. 
then that's where the rub comes. You know, um, it, it, when you when you when you understand that Jesus is the sovereign King, that He is the Lord of Lords and the Host of Hosts, the Alpha and Omega, Omega, beginning and end, He holds all authority. That we that, that He is He is the King. Like that's the dividing thing. Yeah. You know, someone, uh, one of my friends recently, who's not a believer, was like, "Man, I want to believe. I mean, I want to believe. It's just the whole Jesus thing is the that's that. That's just that part." And I, you know what I said to her? I said, "Exactly. That's you. You've hit up against the deal. Yeah. Jesus is the dividing line. G the master. So I think when when you think about the centrality of Jesus being the fulfillment of all the prophets and all the law." on the Mount of Transfiguration, and that being our context here, that, that he is central, he inspired the scriptures, all the in scriptures were inspired through him. That's that's on the on God's side of the economy. On man's side, it's a man-centric religion that leads to sensuality and abuse because it's saying, I'm in charge, not him. He's not the master, I'm the master. Yeah. I think that's the hallmark of heresy. At the end of the day, that's no, what it's all that's about, exactly right? Right? Because, because every like we've said before, people embrace the idea of Jesus being a savior, but when he's depicted as Lord, there's where the problem is. Because that means you have to surrender. So that's why he he used this phrase, I think, where he said they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. Well, that's a lordship thing. If if the Lord bought us, that means he owns us. We're surrendered to him. We're slaves of him. So you brought up the one hallmark about not acknowledging Jesus as Lord, the sovereign Lord. But the other two that he uses are found in verse 10. And I'm skipping all the way down there because he just says it in a nice bumper sticker statement. It said this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature, which is a throwback to chapter one and verse four about the corruption in the world caused by evil desires in that flesh. Yeah. in the flesh. And the second thing is, and despise authority. Yeah. Don't tell me what to do. So I mean, th those are, those are the three hallmarks right there. The, the, just think you deny the sovereign Lord. You, you are indulging in the sinful nature. And you despise authority, but they don't just despise authority. They 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 don't despise their own authority. Well, they despise right. the Others authority of the one who bought them. I would <laughs> so. say of any of any anybody besides themselves is really what that's the it. Accurate. It's the centrality of of the, of it's humanism. You know, you know, it it really is humanism at the very beginning. That's why he went to such lengths, by the way, in the first part of the book to describe what the character and qualities look like in a person where Jesus is Lord. He spent a lot of time describing what that looked like because he's fixed and spent a lot of time describing what it looks like when you lose control of that, what that looks like. And trust me, it's nothing like what we described in the first chapter. I, I do want to, I do want to, well, everybody go ahead. Zep. I say everybody wants to get away from boundaries. They want to get away from, from uh, limits. They want to get away from, uh, you know, any boundary to my existence, I just want, I want to get rid of anything that would hinder me and, and contain me. But I was thinking about this the other day uh, when I was in a conversation with Jill about this culture in the world. I was like, man, what if we just did a, a little thought experiment about authority and about boundaries? What, what if just collectively as a, as the world, the world got together and was maybe started here on the unashamed podcast. We announced today and the whole world, everybody in the world, followed suit and we're going to do this for 30 days and here here's the rule for 30 days we're going to try this thought experiment about authority and we're just going to limit it to, to our sexual expression everybody for 30 days if you have a sexual urge just go go do it go fulfill it for 30 days what would happen to the world if there were no boundaries whatsoever in 30 that just just on sexuality then you could extrapolate that to, to materialism, per, whatever. If you want something material, go get it. For th I mean, like there has to be limits around things. There, I mean, there has to be for things to function and for the world to, to to progress and for there to be any kind of order in the world. And I think that's what is interesting about this is that when you when you look at a heresy, um. It typically is to say, let's remove the boundary, let's remove the authority, and whatever the thing is over me, I want to remove that, 
and then I'm going to become my own authority. But when I do that in my own life, it's the old Dr. Phil question. You know, how's it working out for you? It, it's never worked out for me when I become my own authority. And I think that's the point that this is kind of getting to is he's building this case of it doesn't work very well when we leave the authority of God and the authority of Scripture. Well, to your point, and I'll validate your point uh, scripturally. So in 1 Corinthians 6, when Paul made this argument about fleeing sexual immorality in verse 18, he then in 19 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? And this is you know, the context of, of uniting yourself with a prostitute. Now, he could have said, well, you may get a disease, or you, which is true, or, or you're having a breakdown of your family or, you know, there's a lot of reasons that he could have said, but of all the ones that he, he wound up going with, he says, uh, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own. And he uses the same phrase found in second Peter two, you were bought at a price. Yeah. Therefore honor God with your body. You're like, why does this keep coming up that we've been bought? by the blood of Jesus, because ultimately it goes back to what he said in second Peter and in, in the way you live your life, temptation's going to happen not once a week, not once a month. It's going to happen every day. You're going to be, have trials every day. Things are not going to go your way every day. So all these qualities that he said that we need to be growing in are things that we can use as we get through the day to be effective for, for Jesus. And people see that in our lives. They're like, Oh wow, there's something different. So about I got that. an illustration. So, even- but I was just going to finish the thought by saying, but then he said, but when you're not doing that, you have forgotten that you've been cleansed from your sins, which goes back to the being bought. So I got a, an illustration that ma- that makes that point to see so more, point. more fascinating because it's pre Christ. And that's Joseph in Genesis 39 Whenever he is taken into captivity, he's in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife wants to sleep with him. He's a young buck. He's only like 18, 20 years old. So he's her slave, and so she's trying to sleep with him, and he tells her, he says, Potiphar, her husband, has put everything in this house under my charge. He's given her a speech. It made me think about when you said this. He said, everything here I'm in control of except one thing, you, because you're his wife. You'd think the next thing out of his mouth was, and therefore to not violate what he's, because you're his wife. But he didn't say that. He said, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Yeah. That, Which that's is fascinating. The, that's the difference. That's what people are not, the false prophets are not considering. Exactly. And here was, a, so here's a guy, a teenager who says, I don't want to do such a wicked thing as sin against God, who way back in the ancient days. That's faith. I mean, yeah, that's... That, that, that's, a, that's a great point. And I think that's why you see when you, when you, separate, uh, when you separate that and, you ha- and you're gonna, we're going to remove the master as, as the ultimate allegiance, you know, when we remove Jesus as the ultimate allegiance and you put yourself in the position of, the ult- of your own master, you're, you're, your own, you're the master of your own destiny, it is interesting to me that verse two, that once you do that, the, the, the two places that you go, listen to this, sensuality and greed. That's where you end up. You end up like, I, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to exploit sensuality and greed. I'm going to become, it, it's because what happens is you become your own God and you have to consume everything around you to keep that facade up. I mean, but 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 it it doesn't work. That's that's the thing. It just doesn't work. Nobody on the planet has ever got enough money where they've said, "Man, now I'm finally got there. This is enough. I'm good." I mean, everybody. It's like the old. Um, there's a movie I watched about the fall. I think it was about the fall of Lehman Brothers. And one of the characters in the movie, they ask him what is. Uh, he was like the head of Lehman Brothers, and uh, Shia LaBeouf's character. I think that's who was in it. Said, "What's your number?" And the guy went, my number. Yeah, what's your number when you hit this amount of money that you're good? And the guy looked at him and responded, more. And I think that's the problem with when you follow the way of sensuality and the way of greed. There's You never get to the end of it. I, I, you just don't. There's never You never get enough 
sensuality where you're like, finally, I'm fulfilled. By the way, finally, I've got. By there. the way, where, where did uh, with uh, verse fourteen, two fourteen, Second Peter, uh, they'll be paid back with harm for the harm they've done. Their idea of pleasure to carouse in broad daylight. Their blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. Eyes full of adultery. This is some of the toughest language in the entire Bible. They never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They're experts in greed and a cursed brood. I, I don't know who this next one's about. Maybe y'all do. They have left a straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness. Where's that story? No, that's the one yeah, that was rebuked by the donkey. Yeah, we were, we were talked about that in the, oh, the overtime. Talk, the talking dump. Yeah, yeah, that's talk, the well, dump. because, and we can, we'll read that, but, that story. Probably next podcast. Yeah, when we get there. But he basically was had a choice between money and saying what, what the king wanted him to say or doing what, what God, God wanted him to do. That that was the decision. I mean, it's a long story, and I think we should read it because it's fascinating. It is. And uh, he couldn't get his donkey going because there was in the the there was an angel in the road with a sword drawn that only the donkey could see. Well, the donkey wouldn't go, and so well, <laughs> Balaam kept whipping that donkey, saying. He beat this, the fire out of the poor donkey. The donkey was saving his yeah, life here. <laughs> and finally, that donkey turned around and said, hey, I ain't going. You know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> the Spirit of God uh, allowed the donkey to speak and said, hey, yeah. you're beating the wrong dude. Oh, and then guess what? See, now we get, <laughs> I did this on the uh, overtime of the last podcast. We find out the absurdity of the world at which we live in. Because guess what they're fascinated with in the movie-making world? Talking animals. Talking animals. <laughs> it drives me crazy. And I know where they got it from. Somebody, once upon a time, when they were had just discovered the reels and how to make a movie, somebody was reading their Bible and said, you know what? They had a donkey <laughs> talking. <laughs> it, it all comes back to this. Guess what? We were here first. <laughs> Zach, we that were here happened? first. <laughs> and now you got animals talking all, all the time. And then when I bring up Jesus, they're like, oh, well, I can't follow Jesus. I'm like, why? Donkey, because in donkey. the Old Testament, you had a donkey talking. That's not possible. <laughs> well, it's not. Uh, There's... A hundred thousand movies that has every cartoon version of an animal saying, beep, beep, watch this. Come here. What? You know, the Lion King people are crying. No, and... So I, you know, I'm just saying there's a, that not to say that they're being false prophets. Cause you got the, the scary thing about this is we're talking about, these are people claiming to be religious. Yeah. The, these are people that, oh. and look, these heresies are destructive. He called. He didn't just say they're heresies; they're destructive heresies. Oh, yeah, they're they're being their lives are being destroyed, and the people who are drawn to this for being a part of this. Therefore, when someone says, "Well, how does that fit in?" Uh, it, it fits in because it's a look at what we now are looking at. Well, we haven't said this yet, but the, the worst part about this, we, we've just been talking about these as people. These are spiritual leaders. Yeah, they're, and, and these they're are exploiting leaders. people. Oh, they're yeah. exploiting people. Like, yeah, they're, they're leaders, and, and they're intentionally exploiting people for money and sensuality. That's exactly right. Yep. Does that sound familiar in the church? Oh, I mean, we, like, oh, I think we have to— uh, we have to I mean that's that's why when we when we ended um, the last book of of uh, Second Peter in chapter five when we talked about the importance of having a you know elder led churches where there's accountability and there's like you know that, and, and this whole idea of authority I mean like we're trying to claim this authority as even pastors claim authority that I don't think is theirs you know what I mean I mean I'm I'm an elder at our church but I mean you know my authority stops at the it begins and ends at the word of God I mean you know but but I, you got be really careful putting yourself under people's authority who are claiming to have authority that they don't actually have um, and and not allowing yourself to be taken captive by charismatic leaders who maybe have I man they can they can pull you and reel you in 
you know, and they, but, but man, you, uh, I think this is a major issue. I think a lot of people that I know and including myself have been hurt by the church. You know what I mean? I've had, we got our church hurt. I mean, you guys know our story and you know, uh, I remember when I was in the sixth grade and my dad got fired from the church we were at. And I remember walking in that room, it was, you know, 1500 people in the auditorium when they were kind of having the meeting and, and, uh, I'll never forget that, but you know that that church was abusive. Um, that whole uh, gr- the whole thing was abusive. Basically, Very abusive they in publicly the, the th- fired him in front of the whole group. Yeah, and it was really difficult for us that we went and met, and we actually I grew up most of my but fifth grade onward. Uh, we m- mostly met in house churches because my dad was like so against institutional religion. Now we came out of that, and I mean he's now an elder at our church and you know we, we've healed a lot but I mean, it took years to get over some of that church hurt and some of the abuse that we endured and and our story is as minuscule compared to some of the others of people that we've met with and dealt with you know pastors sexually abusing children very rampant i mean there's just so much of this that goes on and i think that like it's we're right here in the like this this part of second peter is addressing that very thing right here the pastors and and leaders in the church, false teachers, intentionally exploiting people. And he, there is a warning at the end of this that it says, uh, their judgment from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. I mean, that's some scary stuff there. You know, like Dad said, I mean, this is some of the most harsh language in all of the Bible. Man, it is. And especially the New Testament. Peter doesn't pull any punches. And Ooh. as Jace mentioned in one of the past podcasts, I mean, this is definitely his sort of end of life manifesto and, and he's not pulling yes, any punches. There, there's other passages that support this line of thought. You know, I th- I I think first John is a really good especially if you're you're wanting to investigate this this further. Because it kind of travels down the same vein yep. as Peter. And just to give you a thumbnail of where it eventually gets to, you know, he says in first John three, seven, uh, don't let anyone lead you astray. And then he goes on to chapter four, kind of what we were talking about, about testing the spirits. And, you know, when you brought up the, the point about hearing voices and determining who these voices are, he says, test the spirit, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And and look, he, he wrote this a couple thousand years ago, but there's no doubt you see the same pattern over and over and over and over. Because you get why the, the spiritual forces of evil and the evil one, if they make the church look bad to the world, that's that's the greatest thing they can do to keep people from coming to Jesus. Yep. I mean, and it's not hard to do because okay. you're basically no, relying on those those hallmark things that we said, the basic sensual evil human desires and our our uh, obsession with not being under any kind of authority. That that look, I did that was the hardest thing I had to overcome about coming to Jesus. I didn't want anybody telling me what to do. I, I'm, it's There's a basic evil human desire is we want to be our own person and do whatever we want to do, and we think that that's freedom. But we realize what, what Peter's going to get to, everybody is a slave to whatever's mastered him. I mean, that's the truth. So John goes on to say, and he says, just like Peter in verse 2 of chapter 4, 1 John, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. It, it's amazing. It always starts there. Yep. And that's yeah. that heart of Nazism, Jason. Is what, that's yeah. exactly what it's It always about. starts back to who do you think Jesus is? And so, look, every time, I, and y'all probably have figured this out by now, Zach and I both have been involved in many uh confrontations with potential heretics <laughs> along the way because we like to argue you know and, but a lot of times it is sad because we have people even in our own number that get off and are trying to form little coups in their own little groups here and there and but the number one thing that happens right off the bat is the focus is not on jesus because i always say that when i'm in these kind of these heated discussions with people that have gotten off 
I'm like, where's Jesus in all this? And they're like, well, these, these aren't salvation issues. And I'm like, well, why are we talking about them? Why, why are you leaving? Why are you drawing other people away? I mean, where, where, how is this being, how is this going to make Jesus effective and productive in your life? And it's just a question that they usually not at because they're not thinking about Jesus. They're thinking about their own self and having their feelings hurt or whatever it is, you know, or, you know, they found some epiphany from God that, that has been hidden for thousands of years. And now that's, Come to them. But it's like, well, so you're saying we need Jesus and whatever this epiphany you've had to be saved. Or, you know, and that, that's how these things generally go. And so he, he, he speaks more about this, but I want to bring up this verse four. Because you got to remember, you know, a lot of these people have the gift to gab, uh, you know, from a false prophet, which is what Peter was bringing up. You know, they have, it, it wasn't just, invented stories that they're cleverly they're they're clever and they come they just make them up sometimes they're fabricated but it, and we think oh i could see through that look people are gullible if you don't learn anything about life people are gullible and these churches that are you know there's tens of thousands of different groups and what's amazing to me is there's people in the parking lot at every one of them i mean it just shows you how gullible people are and so he goes on to say uh, in verse four, you dear children are from God and have overcome them. And this is the bottom line, which gives us confidence because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And I, you know, I think there's some discernment That's there. That's pretty well some, the bottom line right there. Well, because I think we get intimidated and people are manipulative. You know, we, we used to do this for fun. I'll confess my sins before we go to overtime that, we had a buddy who had the gift of gab, and uh, he would call these psychic hotlines, and we would all gather up because we thought it was funny. Because he always, because he was a believer, he could always turn it around and put them on the defensive. It was hilarious. We, you know, and when you get a large group of people trying not to laugh, because he would call them up, and they would start trying to work him because they're, all they are is hustlers. They, they're really good at figuring out the basic nature of human beings, and they give you an impression that they're, they're predicting what's going to happen to you based on your personality. But he was, better, he was a better hustler, and he had the Lord. So he would turn it around, and they would always hang up on him because he would get in, uh, into their life. He was like, well, you know, because he, he would turn his vision, which is he was making up, into something that would scare them. <laughs> Because he would bring up their I'm trying their to conjure death. up in my mind. I'm trying to figure out who I'm this not, is. No, who yeah, is. I'm I, not I, saying I, who it is. I exactly God, I'm not is. sure the statute of limitations <laughs> has run out on that. But it was I, hilarious. I, I think I know who it we'll is. We'll discuss that But let between. me say this, Al. Before we get to, before we get to overtime, let me say this. I, say I, just, I, I know we're over. But if you want to know a litmus test for what you're sitting under, I think if 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 the messages and the teaching that you're sitting under – if you walk away from it and you think, man, we are right, and it, it, that's probably not a good sign. If you are sitting under t a teacher and, and, and a preacher and you walk away and you think, man, God is good. God is big. Jesus is amazing. Like it, it, when good you point. walk away from that teaching, yeah, you ought to be thinking about Jesus not being right. You have to be thinking about who he is. Exactly. And I think that's the hallmark what Jace is talking about. Where is Jesus in all this? That was a better you way know, to sum of... up what I was trying to describe. That should be the go in every meeting, every argument, every discussion. How, how great is he? All right. Uh, follow us over to overtime. We'll talk a little bit more about that, and then we'll pick this up in Second Peter 2 next time. Uh, Zach, I'm getting a word in my ear. It says you, you will be joining us in overtime. So... I'm going to speak that word to you. <laughs> but I hear other voices from our crew, too, so maybe that's what it is. So we'll see you in overtime. That's, <laughs> if you want to follow us over, blazetv.com slash unashamed. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.